是向前行。欢迎你留守全马第一家中文财经资讯台 City Plus FM。早安，你好，我是运翔，我是志芳。那近来呢 ，City Plus 呢都邀请到了不少的嘉宾啊，到我们节目当中呢分享他们出版的新书或者是回忆录。那么今天的这位嘉宾呢，他的新书《Capturing Hopes: The Struggle Continues for a New Malaysia》。抓住希望，为新马来西亚继续奋斗呢？呃，出版之前其实就引起了非常大的一个讨论，甚至是他早前提出的“筷子论”呢，也掀起了排山倒海的反弹声浪。那说到这里呢，听众或许已经知道了，今天的嘉宾呢，其实就是邀请到了前首相敦马哈迪医生呢，和我们来聊一聊的。OK， 啊、uh, ，Welcome to on the show， 啊、uh, ，Welcome yang amat berbahagia tu。Firstly, congratulations on the publication of your new book, Capturing Hope. The name of the book offer one hope again. This remember me of the excitement when Tun led Pakatan Harapan to topple Barisan Nasional in the 14th general election, where people were looking towards to a better nation. At that time, all believed that a new Malaysia was finally born. So we start with Tun's recent remarks on chopstick. So which has created strong criticism from different parties, especially the Chinese community. So can Tun explain why chopstick? Kita nak cari. We we want to find、uh, something that shows there is a difference in terms of culture.、Mm. Uh, and I choose chopstick because that's the first thing that came to my mind. But I could have said lion dance. I could have said many other things. But、uh, for simplicity, to see the difference, the Malays eat with their hands. The Chinese eat with chopstick. That shows that there is a difference between Malays and Chinese. That is all. The, the idea is to show the difference. It's not to say that chopstick is inferior or or of low quality or anything, because I am aware that the Koreans also use use chopstick, the、uh, Japanese also use chopsticks.、Uh, I think even the Vietnamese use chopstick.、Mm. So chopstick is just a way of eating, but the way of eating. Uh, is different between different races. One of the biggest、uh, difference is some people eat with their hands. The Malays eat with their hands. They,、uh, but the Chinese eat with chopstick. That shows there is a difference in culture. That is、okay. all. I see. Okay. Ah,、uh, so don't. Ah,、uh, at that time, do you foresee this a kind of big backfire after the analogy of chopstick? I could have said、uh, a lion dance, and I think they will make、uh, an issue of that also, because these are people who are always looking for ways to run down each other. You see, the Malays will say something about the Chinese. Chinese say something about the Malays. Normally, quite innocent remark, but uh, these uh, uh, extremists. They want to make an issue so that、uh, people will always、uh, find it dif-、uh, difficult to get along with each other. That is their their. It's not the feeling of all Chinese. I myself have learned how to use chopstick because sometimes I have Chinese food. I use chopstick, and when we have the Chinese New Year isheng, we use chopstick.、Uh, that that is、uh, the. Chinese custom to use chopstick. There's nothing to that except that the Malays don't use chopstick. That is all. Hmm. Okay. So Tun, you have mentioned that、um, you are using chopsticks too, and you want to、uh, emphasize the thing about the difference be-、uh, in culture. So maybe some、uh, some people think that you are playing with.、Um, Racial cards to gain popularity. Do you have anything to clarify, or do you have any comment on this? No. When I talk about the chopstick, it was to show the difference 
And what I have said is that in many countries, multiracial countries, the migrants who uh, enter a country and want to become citizens, they adopt the culture of the people of that country. They even forget their, their language. Yes. We have in Malaysia mm. a lot of uh, people of Indian and Arabic uh, uh, origin, mm. but they have become totally Malays because they can't speak their own language. They speak only Malay. Their custom and way of life is uh, the Malay way of life. So then, of course, they are fully accepted as a fellow citizen. But uh, in Malaysia, the Indians and the Chinese insist upon uh, reminding each other that we are from there. We are not from here. Even though you are born in this country, brought up in this country, you still call yourself, link yourself with your country of origin. I can imagine the first migrant coming here, uh, finding it difficult to adopt. But those who are born here, brought up here, they know the culture of the local people. Uh, they can become, uh, well, very much identified with the uh, local people. Uh, we see this in Indonesia. In Indonesia, there are more Chinese uh, than in Malaysia. Yet their language, their home language is Malay or Indonesian Malay. And I don't know whether they use chopstick or not. But also in, uh, in Thailand, uh, in uh, Philippines, they use the language of the country that they have adopted as their country. Hmm. Okay, uh, Tun, sometimes people are confused by the way Tun doing things and some of the Tun's comment because sometimes people see Tun are open, progressive, moderate, but sometimes seem to be a little bit conservative, uh, extreme or radical, just choice of words. So do people <coughs> misunderstand Tun? Yes, I think, you see, during the time when I was Prime Minister for 22 years, hmm. Chinese business uh, did much better than during the British time. Uh, people don't realize it. During the British time, the British cut off the Chinese from big business. All big business goes to the British. They have companies like Mansfield and the like. And government uh, supplies comes through crown agents no local no local chinese can supply anything even if it is easily available and cheaper but the british insist that all government supplies procurements must come from through crown agent a british company so during the british time there were restrictions against uh, local particularly Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese businesses. They were able to have only shops uh, along the streets, uh, retail shops, but no big business, uh, except in, excepting for one or two. Uh, for example, Robert Koch was able to get a monopoly of the supply of sugar and flour. That was uh, uh, something else. The other thing is... Uh, the British did not allow the Chinese to have banks. They allowed only one bank, the OCBC. That was in Singapore. And in Malaysia, they had Banheng Lee bank, bank, but small bank, doing only little business, not financial uh, uh, support for business and all that. But when we became independent, practically the first day of independence, two Chinese companies applied for banking license. One is Malayan Bank, Malaysian Bank, which is now today Malayan Banking. The other one is uh, UMBC, United Malaysia Banking Corporation. Two banks, because now uh, with independence, 
all the restriction on Chinese business was removed by a Malay government. You see, so we didn't go against uh, the, the Chinese after independence, although the government was Malay. Unfortunately, less attention was paid to Malay demands, which was the reason why uh, the people were against uh, Tunku. They, they think, they thought that uh, the Tunku didn't do anything for the Malays. You see? But the Chinese also, of course, because they are, uh, they understand opportunities given to them and they make use. But the Malays, even when you give them opportunities, they misuse it. So the reason why there was uh, uh, the uh, um, riots of 1969 is because the Malays see the Chinese already uh, getting better, uh, doing better, whereas the Malays were not getting any opportunities. This, this aspect is often, often missed out by most people. They didn't realize that independence brought a lot of freedom to Chinese business. Chinese business today have grown into world business. You know, they have a couple of hotels all over the world and all that. They did very well. But the Malays, uh, even given opportunities, uh, do not know how to make use of the opportunities in order to improve their situation. Uh, okay, Tun, but right now some business community complain that uh, the business environment is too crowded because of the GLC and previously the new economy policy NEP or Dasa Economy Baru DEP has uh, limited uh, has limited the 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 the, 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 the expansion of certain business. So what 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 is uh, Tun's comment on that? The, the thing is that uh, in business uh the the Malays do not get any opportunities from the Chinese. So the government has to step in and give opportunities to the Malays. But the Chinese also do get opportunities. But obviously the Malays did not make proper use of the opportunities. And but the Chinese know how to make use of the opportunities. So if the government doesn't favor the Malays, what will happen is that Malays will have no role to play at all in business because they cannot get contracts from Chinese companies. For example, if the Chinese want to build a, a building, uh, Malay contractors normally do not get. Uh, so they depend upon the government. So the government uh, favor the Malays because the private sector does, do not uh, favor the Malays private sector being mainly Chinese. The government has to balance that by giving more opportunities to the Malays. But the Chinese feel that the government is helping only the Malays, which is not quite true. Because if the government doesn't help the Malays, who will help the Malays? The Malays are expecting to get their contracts, their jobs and all that from the government. That is all. Because the private sector will not give any uh, jobs, any contracts to the Malays. So the, it looks as if the government is favoring the Malays. But actually what is happening is that the Malays cannot get a business from the non-Malays um, for many reasons. So the government has to step in and create opportunities for them. But if these opportunities is uh, uh, given also to the Chinese uh, equally, then the, probably the Malay business will fail because they are not good in business. And then it means also many of the big jobs cannot be done by the Malays. This is a fact. We look through, we can see that big major contracts by the government go to Chinese companies simply because the, the Malays do not have the capacity. Construction work, big buildings and all that do not go to the Malays. And when we give small contracts to the Malays, like uh, 
this computer lab, very small contracts, we give them to a lot of Malays. Even that, they failed. They didn't know how to do the business. So it looks as if the government is favoring the Malays. But the Chinese can have their own contracts from uh, their own community, which is already growing. But the Malays cannot get any business at all because the private sector doesn't give jobs to the Malays and only the government can do that. But of course, the government also gives jobs to the Chinese. So, then you mention that um, the situation is Malay can't get businesses from non-Malay uh, community. So, throughout this year, I believe that uh, government has done a lot. Do you think that the situation has getting better? Or do you think that the situation where Malay businessmen, uh, do they really manage to get a lot or uh, businesses from non-Malay community, do you think the situation is getting better? Not much. Uh, we don't see much of uh, contracts by the private sector for the Malays. That is a fact. We can study it. Mm. Lately, of course, there is some attempt. For example, we find uh, Vincent Tan, for example, uh, giving the top job to a Malay. That is very unusual. Usually in a Chinese company, the top job goes to a Chinese, maybe also to the relative, relative of the businessman. But now, slowly, they are... Be, be, well, I hope that what Vincent does is a new attitude. And this is very good for the country because then the Malays cannot say that the Chinese do not give uh, opportunities to them. But of course, they must perform. So at the moment, maybe uh, the Malays tra track record is not so good. So mm -hmm. many of them don't get opportunities. But I hope in future, uh, more contracts are given to by Chinese companies to Malays and uh, uh, more uh, jobs also in Chinese companies should be given to Malays who are capable. So, Tun, they are quite ironic during your first tenure as Prime Minister for 22 years. The Chinese claim that uh, you are ultra-Malay, you're looking or only taking care of the Malay business. But the Malay blaming that you taking care, uh, you give a lot of big contract to the Chinese tycoon, to the Tan Sri, Tan Sri. So, what, what does it happen? What went wrong? Why people, on this side, people claiming that uh, you are ultra-Malay. On the other side, people say that uh, you are not taking care of Chinese. So, how you strike a balance? Why ironic this, uh, this, uh, this situation? Yeah, a lot of people link what uh, the choice I make to being favoring the Malays. But actually, it is based on ability. Can you do it? If you cannot do it, it's no good giving a contract to you because you are going to fail. So even among the Malays, we give to some people who have uh, achieved some success. Uh, so people like uh, Said Mokhtar and all that, these people on their own have uh, done well. So projects that are difficult, big, requires a lot of expertise, we give to these people who can deliver. It's not because they are my friends, but they are people who can uh, make you, uh, deliver what they uh, ask to do. So, but lots of people call them my cronies. They are yes. not my cronies. I didn't know Seth Mota uh, before. He was doing business more in Johor, but I heard about him. When he made an application, I studied. For example, he wanted to build a port costing 4 billion ringgit. I thought it's impossible for him to do it. But uh, I look and find that he has managed ports before. Pasir Gudang, for example. And we take a risk. We give it to him. And he was able to deliver. And of course, when he was able to deliver, other opportunities also seem to go to him because he can deliver. 
But if I give a, a contract to anybody who has no experience, no capital, no know-how and all that, if I give to them, they're going to fail. So I do give to some of them, but these people fail. And when they fail, they are not regarded as my cronies. But when they succeed, they are regarded as my cronies. That is the problem that I face. Because on the one hand, I want to help the Malays. On the other hand, I want to have the projects done, done properly. If they don't have the capacity, it's no good uh, so-called helping him, them. They must be asked to do what they can do, what they have proven. But at the same time, many Chinese uh, were able to get uh, something out of all the government contract. Supposing we give a contract to build a building uh, to a Malay company, he has to get all the building materials from the Chinese because the Malays don't have building material. They have to buy the sand, they have to buy the cement, they have to buy the steel, and all kinds of things they have to buy from the Chinese. So even though we give to the Malays, the Chinese also, also benefit. Mm. This is true. If you care to examine, this is the reality. Okay. So then let's talk about your book. So your book is basically compressed, uh, comprises of three, uh, 13 chapters, uh, which we can mention here. Okay, uh, chapter 7 is about the new Malay dilemma. Chapter 9 is about education and ethics. Chapter 11 is about the fall of Harapan. So it seems to me that all are important. If let's say our audiences have uh, limited time, which is the must read or first read chapter would you recommend it? Well, if you want to know how difficult it is for PH to take over the government, uh, this book <coughs> this book itemizes the problems we face to take over the government. It's not easy. In many countries, when there is a, a change of government, there will be a lot of uh, fighting, a lot of even civil war. But in Malaysia, it was done quite smoothly. Uh, the, we have to deal with uh, civil service that has been serving BN for the past 60 years. Now they had to, to work for the people who were against, the, 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 against them before. Uh, of course, they were, uh, well, com uh, they were condemned for not being efficient and all that. But now they have to work with those people. And it takes a little bit of time to adjust. And the new government also has no experience. No experience in government. They have experience in being the opposition. But as a government, they don't have. And they actually do not know how to work with the civil service. As a result, it takes time to make the adjustment. There are many other problems that we face, including the contracts given to, to, the, uh, uh, to the business people by Najib's government. The contracts were very costly, uh, very, very much above the actual cost. Uh, so we suspect that part of the money has been used to give to the government, uh, to, the, to uh, Razik. Najib, for example. So we want to punish Najib. But you cannot punish Najib by taking action against the contract. Because now the contract is being done by some people. And if you punish them, Najib has taken the money. He's okay. But the contractor is using a lot less money to build whatever is, uh, uh, he has to do. But you try to reduce the cost. He cannot reduce the cost because the what is left of the money, the contract money, is just sufficient for him to make some profit. But uh, the government at that time wanting to punish Najib, punish the contractor. And the contractor, of course, have got a lot of workers, a lot of laborers 
a lot of uh, suppliers, a lot of uh, subcontracts and all that. And when you punish them, it's not Najib who is punished. It is these people who is punished. So to make adjustment like that was very difficult for us. And a lot of problems like that. If you read, the, I think, chapter 6 or 7, uh, you'll find how difficult it was for the new government to run the country. First, we don't have the experience. Many of the ministers don't have the experience. And then we were given certain things to be done within a short period of, of time, within 100 days. Not much can be done by 100 days. And then there were things that requires amendments to the constitution. For amendments to the constitution, you need a two-third majority. We did not have a two-third majority. So although promises were made, but the people did not give us the two-third majority so that we can carry out the promises. So that is why there were delays. Uh, sometimes we cannot do what we promised to do. But we uh, hope, of course, over time we can uh, uh, fulfill the promises we made in our manifesto. Okay, uh, Tun, after almost three weeks, the book launched on December 12th uh, last year. What was the reaction? Did Tun get positive feedback or otherwise? Some harsh criticism accusing Tun for rewriting history. What's uh, Tun's response on that? Well, this is a reaction based on the, the attitude of the people. Some people who are against me can find nothing right about what I have done. Some people who are my supporters uh, find that I have done a good job. So it doesn't reflect a proper analysis of the things that was done. But if you were to analyze the things that were done within a few months of being in the government, you can find a lot of things done. For example, we had to change uh, some senior members of the civil service because they were corrupted. So we had to change. But when you want to change, you have to find somebody who is better. And that's not easy because we don't know many of them. So that takes time. And then when you want to change, the person must be capable of doing the work. This is not the work he has done all the time. So he has to take time to learn and to adjust also. And uh, now he is working for people he was against before. They were used to working with BN. Now they are going to work with people who are against BN. And that takes some adjustment. And then, of course, the problem of money. Najib spent huge sums of money. In fact, in order to pay for the interest uh, of 2 billion ringgit. The government had no money. Luckily, one of the people who sold a power plant to the government gave the government 2 billion ringgit free to pay for the debt. That means that the, the price they, uh, they bought, the government bought, was very high. And not having money means a lot of things cannot be done. And we have to be very careful <clears throat> because, as you know, <coughs> we have this pandemic and many people were suffering. We have to attend to their suffering. We have to provide food, fresh food and everything. And uh, uh, people cannot work properly. So the, the period that we took over was not the easiest period even for a normal government. Even other governments not going through this uh, change of government, find difficulty how to look after the people. But we managed to help a lot of people. But when we read some of the chapters, they deal with the problems we were faced with and we were able to overcome. So it's not been easy. You are not taking over like when, when I took over the government in 1981. Everything was fine. Uh, I'm not changing government. It is the same government. 
the same civil service. Uh, and it was easy. Just a change of prime minister. So that time was easy. Today, we are changing government. From a government that was in power for 60 years, you are going to change uh, to a new government that has no experience at all in becoming the government. Just imagine the difficulty that arises. Lots of difficulty, including uh, the um, what happened was that uh, Najib uh, put his men in charge of all things, uh, including, of course, the ministers, the, the heads of the government companies and all that, the various <coughs> institutions. <coughs> all these had political heads because Najib wants to make sure they support him. But when we became uh, the government, we changed all those. We put in professional people. But as you know, the professional people were got, got rid of by Mohidin and put, they put in again the, the uh, political people who support the government. So it's not been easy. But at least uh, in Malaysia, there is no violence. There is no violence. Nobody uh, uh, had strikes or anything like that. Mm. So in a way, the transition from Najib to PH was uh, quite smooth. And even after we were ousted and uh, there is a transition to Mohidin's government, backdoor government, even that does not cause any violence. Okay. So, Tun, maybe we can talk about the current political landscape. So, Pejuang is the latest Malay political party with only four MPs. So, what does Pejuang stand for? Will Pejuang make any headway in the next general election? Yeah. Because the Malay vote is a very big vote. And largely, they support uh, UMNO. Mm. Because UMNO is a Malay party. If you want to uh, fight against UMNO, if you're not a Malay party, the Malays will not support. That is a fact. <clears throat> For example, in Malaysia, you find uh, people uh, vote according to their race. Mm. They are in the middle of the town where the majority of the people are Chinese. They vote for DAP or MCA. Uh, in the rural areas where most of the people are Malays, they vote for Malay parties. And the Malay party that dominated for 60 years uh, was the AMNO. To fight against AMNO, we need to have a Malay party. It's not that we are against non-Malays, but we have to have a Malay party because if we don't get support from a Malay party, we cannot win. The opposition has tried many times. Uh, they come together, they have Pakatan Rakyat and all that, but they can never win Malay support. So because they couldn't win Malay support, they couldn't overthrow the government. Until the 13th election, uh, the uh, Malay-dominated parties still win. So in order to break that, uh, that uh, attitude of the Malays to uh, vote only for Malay parties, we had to have a Malay party. And this Malay party is um, Pajuang. Initially, Bersatu was also a Malay party. But, you know, they switch over. So we had Pajuang. And we hope that Pajuang will be able to contest against AMNO in the next election. But that does not mean that Pajuang will, have, will form a Malay government. The government, of course, must include um, other races as well. Just like the AMNO, when AMNO was the government, there were Chinese, there were Indians, there were Kadazan, and we will do that also. And uh, we will take into consideration the needs of the Chinese because we realize that this is a multiracial country. We cannot have a Malay Muslim government alone. This is what uh, Najib uh, talks, talks about. He wants to have a Malay Muslim government. 
but you you can't have a Malay Muslim government in Malaysia because it's difficult to get enough support. So Malay Pejuang, although it is a Malay party, if we win, we want to work with other non-Malay parties which believe in fighting against corruption, in good governance. We will work with them in order first to achieve majority and secondly, of course, to provide good governments for all the races, not just for the Malays. So, Tun, what are the differences between AMNO, Bersatu and Perduang, in which Bersatu is the breakaway from uh, AMNO, and then Perduang is the splinter party of Bersatu. So, what are the main differences between these three Malay party? If you look at uh, Bersatu and Perjuang, mm. you will find that they were founded by ex amno people. ex amno people because these amno people was not happy, were not happy with Najib because of his corruption and all that. So the difference between amno and Perjuang and Bersatu is that we were against corruption. But unfortunately, when Bersatu uh, decided to work with Najib, they also became corrupted. Uh, for example, uh, people who support Bersatu in the new government, Muhyiddin's government, they were asked whether they, uh, they support uh, Muhyiddin or not. And so it is, uh, if they do, then they can join the government. Because joining the government means you make a lot of money. So it is a kind of corruption. So Bersatu is no longer a Malay party because it needs uh, non-Malays also. So Bersatu now is a multiracial party. But uh, Pejuang is still a Malay party. Amno is still a Malay party. So the contest in the next election is between Pejuang, a Malay party, versus AMNO, a Malay party. So we hope that because AMNO has become very corrupted, that Malays will change and support Pejuang. So, so Pejuang is uh, championing uh, Malay rights. So why is Pejuang still choosing a Malay-centric agenda, given that Malaysia has been independent for 65 years, and Malay is the dominant race in Malaysia? <clears throat> well, uh, the development of the two races is very different. You see, I've been in politics for more than 80 years. Uh, before Malays, Chinese and Indians, they all poor, very poor. The Chinese and the Indians came to Malaysia because uh, Malaysia was under British rule and they can get jobs and do business here. In their own country, they find it difficult to do business. And some of them were brought here by the British. So we expect that uh, the three races, Malays, Chinese and Indian, will uh, prosper as the country grows. But we find that uh, the Chinese especially were much more able to make use of the opportunities, especially after independence, to develop their economy. Today, the Chinese are far ahead of the Malays. Uh, at one time, Malay ownership of corporate wealth was only 2%. The Chinese uh, uh, share was 30%, and the foreigners was 60%. So, now we took away much of what belongs to the uh, uh, foreigners to give to the Malays. For example, the estates and all that, the government and board, but not to personal Malays. Two companies set up with the Malays, like the PNB and others. They were funds that can buy uh, for the Malays these, uh, these uh, estates belonging to the foreigners. So that increased the share of the Malays, but still the share total up only 20%. But the Chinese not only bought the foreign companies, 
but they also started new companies, many, many different com kinds of companies. And they have done so well that now Chinese companies from Malaysia build buildings in Singapore, build buildings in Australia, and also in Pakistan and, and other places because they have made tremendous progress. But the Malays are still very far behind. So the proportion now is that the Malays are said to have 20% but largely by the funds, owned by the funds. But the Chinese have got very much more than 30%. So we still have not achieved a good balance. The disparity between Chinese and Malays is still very far. Very far. Now, my, my understanding of history is that most uh, revolution, uh, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, was between the rich and the poor. And as you know, they threw away the, the kings and all that. But in Malaysia, unfortunately, most of the rich were non-Malays. Most of the poor are Malays. So in addition to just the difference in terms of uh, wealth, ownership yeah. well, there is also the difference in terms of race. And that is very dangerous because at certain time, the poor races will rise against the rich. In fact, in 1969, this already happened. But because of some correction that we made, like the new economic policy, the, uh, the disparity is not so great now. Now we have Malay millionaires even, Malay billionaires even. So the feeling is that they are having a share of the wealth. So the likelihood of their fighting against uh, other races is much less. What we want to do is to reduce the disparity in wealth between rich and poor and between Malays and non -Malays. Okay, uh, noted. Uh, Tun, does our political sphere overcrowded with too many political parties, especially Malay Party and also Malay Dominance Party like AMNO, PAS, Bersatu, Perjuang, Amana, and some say Keadilan? So, is political fragmentation good <laughs> for our democracy? Literally means rakyat have more choices. So, what is your thought, Tunes? Yeah, it is good to have more choices for the rakyat. But uh, then more choices... But as you know, when you have many parties, most of the parties are small parties. On their own, they cannot form the government. They need to work with other parties. So, when they have an election, the Malay voters are split up into four or five small groups. But the Chinese are different. They are not uh, very much attached to their parties. Uh, if they feel that the MCA is doing something good for the Chinese, they support MCA. But when MCA seems to be doing something else, not supportive for the Chinese, they support DAP. Because they are very mobile. They can support both. So, in, in the end, of course, uh, the Chinese minority is often more, uh, more successful than the Malay because when the Malays fight each other, each, uh, each party would be very small. So, the Chinese minority can determine who should win by giving their support to that party. Now, in 1969, I contested in my constituency uh, against PAS. Only, only PAS is my, there's not a split up. And uh, in 1964, in, in, I, I contested there, but the Chinese gave their full support to me. And I won with 4,200 votes. But in 1969, uh, some Chinese believe that I was a Malay ultra. 
that I don't care for the Chinese. So they pull out 3,000 votes from me. But 3,000 votes, I could still win because I won before by 4,200. But they gave that 3,000 to Pati Pass and Pass won because I, I cannot get 6,000 votes uh, to come to be uh, during the 1969 election. So the Chinese minority, although it is a minority, can play a very important role in determin determining which Malay party should win. If you have three or four Malay parties, the party that gets Chinese support will win. Okay. So to, maybe you can talk about uh, what is your thought on the current situation or the current political landscape? Will it be fragmented further since we have some new parties such as uh, Party Kuasa Rajat, Party Bangsa Malaysia? So what is your thought? I think all these new parties doesn't serve much uh, for the country. We don't need so many parties because when they are split, it's impossible for them to win because they are all small. Uh, they will depend on being supported by Chinese and Indian. Sometimes they cannot get this support. So in the end, the party that is strong, the Malay party like AMNO and even Pujuang may not win because of the split up of the Malay voters. They are split into four or five or six. So they are very small. Of course, these are uh, constituencies where the Malays make up a majority. Say the Malays make up 60% of the uh, voters there. But that 60% is divided into three or four. So it is actually fighting against 20% or 15%. So with that number, they cannot win. But if one party is supported by the Chinese, then the, probably they can get a majority and they can win. This was what happened to me, as I said just now, during the 1969 election. The Malays were supportive of me, but because the Chinese switched uh, the, their voting to pass, pass one. So, Tun, uh, would Pejuang choose a partner for the next GE? And who is the right choice for Pejuang? Is Pakatan Harapan or Warisan or Muda or others party? Well, we have to take into consideration many of the feelings of the people. You see, if you go to, if you need Malay support. Uh, if you are associated with a Chinese party, you may not get the Malay support. So in the next election, what is important is that there should be a change of government in favor of a clean government, a government that is uh, uh, not corrupt and all that. There are not many parties which are free from corruption. We know that AMNO is corrupt. We know that parties formed by AMNO uh, break off uh, section would be corrupt. So we hope that the corrupt parties will not be supported by the people. The people want a clean government. They must study the different parties contesting and they should support a clean party a party that is not involved in corruption uh, in Najib's kind of government. So if they really support clean government, we feel that uh, there will be a change of government, a change from a, a, a corrupt government to a clean government. This is our hope. And Bajuang, Bajuang of course, is made up of those members of AMNO who are against AMNO because of the corruption of Najib. So we hope that we can get support because we promise to provide good governance that we will not be corrupt. 
all Pujuang members and uh, uh, candidates will have to uh, take an oath that they will not be influenced by, they will not use corruption to win, that they will not be influenced by money. Okay, okay, Tun, let's touch a little bit on DAP because during your tenure as PM 1.0, uh, 22 years, DAP is a strong criticism on your, your leadership. And then how does DAP change during Barisan Nasional, Pakatan Harapan, and now under Perikatan Nasional Regime? So uh, how is your, your, your thought on that? Uh, DAP dari lawan jadi kawan. So, what is your thought on that? Your feeling, your personal feeling? Yeah. <clears throat> well, DAP, as you know, was a part of PAP of Singapore. Mm. PAP of Singapore. At that time, Singapore was a part of Malaysia. So, they were contesting as PAP, not DAP. And uh, the people rejected PAP. As you know, PAP contested against uh, all MCA candidates, but PAP won only one seat. Devanaya got uh, one, one seat. All the rest lost. But then uh, the Tunku at that time felt that the uh, uh, DAP, the PAP is too much concentrated on trying to overthrow uh, MCA. It is uh, mainly about Chinese politics. So at that stage, the Tunku decided that uh, Singapore should leave Malaysia and Malaysia should not have a party like uh, PAP. So the P P PAP branch became DAP, but with the same philosophy as PAP of, of, uh, of uh, Singapore. That is why their slogan was Malaysian Malaysia, which means that in Malaysia, the, the, there are not many Malaysians because everything goes to the Malays. So when they take that attitude, <clears throat> they represent Chinese views and know uh, nothing about Malay views. After many elections, they found that being Chinese alone cannot make them win and have a role in government. So they began slowly to change. They realized that they must also have Malay support. So, <coughs> so they begin to accept Malay members and also to accept Malay candidates for election. But this is very small. Largely, the DAP is still dominated by Chinese and the Malays remain very suspicious of the DAP. They don't want to support the DAP. Although there are some Malays who become members of DAP and also stand for election uh, as DAP candidates. But uh, DAP finds after some time that uh, their policy is not going to win them the election. They cannot become the government. They realize that they must have Malay support before they become the government. So slowly they begin to accept more Malays, uh, even among the leadership. So in 19, in 2013, the 13th general election, they tried, but still there was not enough Malay support. So in, in facing on the 14th election, Bersatu joined. Now, Bersatu is a Malay party. So, when Bersatu joined, the chances of the Malays supporting PH becomes better. Before, with Pakatan and Rakyat, not, not many Malay support. But with PH, there was Malay support. And because of that Malay support, the DAP won a very big number of seats. <clears throat> and Kaadilan also won a big number of seats. So does uh, Amana. And uh, Bersatu also won, we got uh, support from the Chinese. 
So in the end, the, the number of <coughs> support for PH exceeded the numbers for, of support for BN. So that's how BN lost at PH1. So now it looks clear to the Chinese, to the DAP, that if if they want to form a government, they must have Malay support. And Malay support is given by Basatu. <clears throat> but Najib campaigned against PH by saying that PH is not Malay. It's not Malay dominant. Whereas Amno before was dominated by Malays. So they begin to talk about Malay Muslim government, which means that uh, uh, DAP is not, uh, well, it's not accepted by them. So on that basis, they entice the supporters of PH to cross over and join Najib. Because Najib, it seems, will form a Malay Muslim government. So you can see the attitude of DAP changed. At first, it was very strongly Chinese. But over the years, he began to realize that he needs Malay support. This, this is very good. But the Malays themselves are not very convinced about the DAP support. So when they realize that when they voted for PH, the government is not a Malay-dominated government. It is a non-Malay-dominated government. Then some Malays from Basatu and also from Keadilan were persuaded to cross over and join Najib and, uh, and pass to form a new coalition. So that is what happened because the Malays still have distrust for the DAP, which is still dominated by Chinese. But uh, on the other hand, the, the DAP itself is trying to change to cater for Malay support. Okay. So let's talk about um, in the past few decades, Tun has often been labeled as ultra Malay dictator, Maha Firaun, and uh, be, during the 1998 reformasi era. But from your point of view, how would you counter back? <clears throat> yeah, it is good to have a good uh, policy. But that policy must be supported by the people. At the time when the Malays still feel they are not strong, they cannot accept the re reforms that were proposed. Now, what happened for the reform was that uh, Anwar was uh, from Apnu, the Malay party. He was a deputy leader of Amno, But uh, because of this case that he had, he was expelled from Amno. When he was expelled from Amno, his reaction was to form another party to fight against Amno. But he cannot get Malay support for his party. So he decided to fish for non-Malay support. So he formed a party called Kaadilan, Justice Party, and that party is open to non malays And he attacked Amno for being racist. But of course, you can attack the party for being racist. But on the ground, the Malays still fear a losing power. So they are not, uh, they don't consider their attitude as racist. Is just their own security. So, despite An Anwar getting support from the Chinese and Indian, it's not enough for him to get uh, to win any election. So, Kadilan, PH, Kadilan, uh, uh, Amana, and uh, uh, Amana and DAP, three parties, couldn't win election. They need a Malay party. So when we form Bersatu and we join them, then 
they get Malay support. And that's how we won the election. Okay, uh, Tun will Tun will turn ninety seven this year. So will Tun still stand for next GE? These are the most question that uh people would like to ask. So Tun still have huge influence in the Malay community, especially in the Kampung and uh, Felda area. So will Tun still stand for next GE? Well, uh, our main objective in the next election is uh, not to destroy the Malay dominance in the government, but in, to change the government from being a corrupt government to a clean government. So to do that, we must defeat AMNO. Because what we see now is that AMNO may be gaining popularity again as a Malay because the Malays support AMNO. But if the Malays support AMNO, AMNO will, then you will have a corrupt government. It will be led by people who have already shown that they were corrupt. So our objective is actually to fight against uh, AMNO and uh, defeat AMNO. But at the same time, uh, we realize that we have to work, work closely with non-Malays. But the non malays we work closely with must be clean people, not uh, affected by corruption. Okay. Okay. So, Tun, uh, so will you stand for next GE, next general election? <laughs> <laughs> next general election, I'll be 98 years old or 97 years old. Yeah. I know I'm old, but uh, I'm a bit lucky because... I don't, um, I have not lost my ability to interact with people, to uh, argue and to vote, I mean, to lead a party and all that. My party wants me to contest, but I don't think I should. But I will be very strongly uh, supportive of the Pujuang because I believe that at this moment, Pujuang is not associated with PH, it's not associated with BN. We are alone and we are making, we made sure that our people, our leaders, our supporters are against corruption. So we want to fight on our own and we hope that people who are fed up with the uh, politics of the country will give us support because we promise we will uh, provide good governance. Uh, many of our leaders were actually in the AMNO at a time when Malaysia was doing very well. So we want to bring back that kind of Malaysia. A Malaysia that, Malaysia that the leaders <clears throat> do not think about themselves, they think about the country. <coughs> so, Tun, any political ambitions to be the PM for a third time? No, I think not, because I'm too old. Although I can function, uh, if you read my book, you know that when I became the second for the second time, as Prime Minister. The work I did as Prime Minister was much more than when I was first, first, prime, first time Prime Minister because there were so many things to do. I used to work for 18 hours a day and I have done quite a lot. If you look in the book, you know the, the things that you have to do. But if it is now or the third time you want to become Prime Minister, the work is too heavy. Mm. See, I can lend support, but I cannot, I don't think as a person, I can uh, become uh, 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 prime minister. Unfortunately, my party is still very keen to have me as prime minister. I see. So, Dun, how would you sum up your uh, political career in the past 80 years? 
I have been in politics from uh, from the time when I was a teenager, more than 80 years ago. Mm. I, I, I took up politics because uh, I thought that Malaysia can become a developed country. It has the means, the resources, the people who can develop Malaysia. I didn't think about making money. In fact, uh, all the time that uh, I served the party or the government, I never took money. I only spent my own money. Uh, for example, when I was prime minister, all the, the salary I get, I keep because the government provides me with everything except food. Uh, I get a house, I get transportation, I get air, airplane, I get uh, uh, electricity supply, uh, water supply. All this is paid for the government, by the government. I didn't spend anything. So I, it's not the money that, that matters. It is what uh, I could do for the country. And I feel satisfied if what I want to do for the country is achieved by me. Uh, for example, uh, we want to become an industrialized nation. I was able to uh, do something in that direction. And now our export, for example, consists 80% of um, manufactured goods, uh, only 20% of uh, natural products like rubber and tin and the like. So that gives me satisfaction. Money is not the, pro the thing that I want because uh, what can I do with money? I have a good life. I have uh, houses built for me and all that. So money is not important. Serving the country is important. Being proud of the country because it is it became known as a, an Asian tiger. That is more than payment. That gives you job satisfaction. So Tun, in what way do Tun wish the people of Malaysia will remember Tun in the future? As a statesman, visionary leader, legendary, and some say, uh, no half feeling Tun, some say Tun is a contradictory person, and some say ultra Malay. So what would uh, Tun like people to remember you? I actually don't care about what people think. I don't care whether they uh, like or dislike or they praise or they curse me. That will happen when you are dead and gone. People will make analysis and condemn you. Others will make analysis and praise you. That is not important to me. I'm dead and gone. You see, but what is important to me is whether I have achieved what I set out to do for this country. That is important for me, for my own satisfaction. What other people think doesn't matter to me. So people ask about my legacy. I don't care about that. I see. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Tun, a uh, very last question. Very last question before we let Tun go. Okay. So, uh, Tun, any uh, advice or any comment for our political future? Because given that right now, Malaysia politics are very unstable. So, what is your comment to Malaysian and especially to the Chinese community? So, what is your wisdom on that? Well, uh, <clears throat> most multiracial countries, they have one single culture, one single language. We will, should work towards that. Uh, you want to retain your Chinese language? By all means, do. But everybody must have the facility to speak Malay like a Malay. And in fact, we, we find strangely that while politicians can speak Malay very well in Parliament, but others do not speak Malay. Some do not speak Malay at all. So we need to have at least a common language, very important. 
and our cultures should begin to uh, absorb each other. Uh, we should have our own identity, uh, very Malaysian identity. So when we get to a stage where, although we are people of different races, but our cult language, our culture is almost identical, not quite identical maybe, you still retain your Chinese language, but almost identical. That will be, that will lessen identification of race. Uh, when that, uh, and of course we have to correct the imbalances in the country. Everybody should have the same chances to become uh, successful in business and in other things. Currently, we find that in education, the Malays have caught up very much. Uh, for example, today a lot of uh, professionals are Malays and they are very good. They are very good. <clears throat> they have excelled <coughs> in medicine and in many other businesses. So that, that reduces the disparity between the different races. What is true is that in most multiracial countries, uh, that there is only one common language and one common culture. We can't do that immediately, but slowly over time, we hope we can do that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Tun, for taking time off to accept our interview. Wish Tun all the best, good health, Thank you. Terima kasih. Sisi ni.